It's like solving a puzzle where the prize is getting to go to the Maldives for the cost of going to Orlando. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here. I've been a super fan of Brian. We were just catching up a little bit on his company and sort of how I have ran across his company a few years ago because I love my points. And who doesn't love their points? And he is the points guy. So hopefully you all know who Brian is. And if you don't know who Brian is, and we're going to learn a little bit more about Brian as well, but his company is called The Points Guy. He is the founder and CEO. And it's just this incredible online resource for finding the best credit card and travel options out there. And he definitely has guided me over the years and definitely really exciting for me to kind of hear the backstory, which is really what I love to hear about these founders. It started out as a hobby. And even after Brian was uh, in a few different industries, we'll talk about that, you know, this one man traveling show and worked in finance and grew it to over 10 million readers. I mean, it's just insane how this has grown into something so big just out of a passion for travel. We're so thrilled to have Brian here to tell us a little bit about his journey and his path and to becoming just this incredible leader in points, business, travel, loyalty, however you want to re- refer to it. So welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. It's always nice to interview with a fellow points girl in your case. Definitely impressed with what you've built and how smart you are with your points. So thanks for having me. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. So how did this all start? Tell me about Brian back in. Were you always the points guy even before you knew you could use it for uh, travel? I was actually. So I was always a computer nerd in my family. Uh, So I'm 38 now. So I remember it was 1990 when I got our first home computer is this big old IBM box. And I taught myself DOS. And my parents always thought I'd be a computer programmer. Um, I was that obsessed. Like I was always a computer administrator. My parents had no clue what this machine was. And so it's kind of funny when my dad got a job for a startup in the mid nineties, he always had a secretary and all of a sudden he's working from home and he didn't know how to book. He had to book travel on his own. So that was my first job. I was his travel agent (laughs) Because I was using Travelocity, which had just launched. So meanwhile, my dad thought it was this convoluted process. He was paying me, I think, $10 a booking. And I'd do it in two minutes. You know, it was the best business that I had ever created. So uh, so I started off being his little travel agent. And then one year, you know, I was 12 at this point, And he said, well, if you can figure out how to use our frequent flyer miles, we can go on vacation. And that's when I was like, I really figured out the nuances of the programs. And then every year we'd go on insane trips to the Cayman Islands, Barbados, all for pretty much free. That's incredible. And it must have been kind of fun. It was like solving a puzzle in in many ways. And it is to this day. And that's what I tell people. You know, it's like solving a puzzle where the prize is getting to go to the Maldives for the cost of going to Orlando. You know, and that's what I get so much joy out of doing what I do, even though I've sold my business uh, I'm still on board. I'm, I'm passionate about helping people see the light because it is a mentality. And when you realize that loyalty is truly valuable, you know, it takes a little bit of mining knowledge in your head to get these programs down. But once you, you know, unlike most currencies that will lose value or, you know, you can actually mine knowledge into loyalty programs and then get way more value out of them. Uh, And so that's been a joy of mine to bring that uh, to the masses because it used to just be like this small online community of points hackers. Um, And never did I think that the points guy would become, you know, we now have 12 million monthly unique visitors and growing. It was just a way to share my tips because I was always so frustrated. Why does everyone else see the value? You can travel for free first class. Like That's amazing. I love it. So you went to school you ended up working in banking. And uh, so what was the point when you sort of thought, I got to go run this business and, and go and, you know, hang a shingle and, and really get serious about this? In college, I went to University of Pittsburgh and I became student body president. So all of a sudden I started traveling on my own to conferences. I studied abroad in Spain, got a cheap ticket to uh, 
Dublin on spring break. And then all of a sudden I was U.S. Airways gold status. And then I remember it was 2003 or four. I found Flyer Talk, which is the online community of frequent travelers. So I got the real points bug when I plugged into this global network of people out there who were, had been doing what I was doing, you know, for almost a decade at that point. Um, and, and that's when I became points obsessed. But I graduated from Pitt in 2005. My goal, you know, I was in the closet. I was like, I've got to move to New York City. You know, I had a job in a, being a pharmaceutical sales rep in Pittsburgh in pain management of all. And I knew I was like, this is going to be way too grim. I've got to go to New York. I just need to discover myself. And uh, so I, my, the one job I could get was being a buyer for Lord & Taylor. And I went through their uh, buying program. And, uh, and then from there, they were like, Brian, I don't think you're so much of a buyer, which is way more numbers and being behind a desk than I think I realized. And I became best friends with the head of HR. And she's like, come with me, kid. You know, she's like, you need to be out in front of people. So I was the head of college recruiting for Lord & Taylor at age 23. And I was like, I get to get paid to go on college campuses. You know, this is amazing. And then uh, and then once I loved HR, I was like, well, instead of doing it in fashion, this is 06, 07, the boom. You know, this is the pre... All my friends in banking at age 25 were making, you know, huge bonuses. And they're like, come on, work for a bank because, you know, even in HR, you're going to get four weeks vacation, amazing benefits. So I convinced Morgan Stanley to, to hire me. And, and then all of a sudden I was in high tech recruiting. So doing all of the, uh, you know, undergrad, master's, computer science recruiting, convincing kids to work at Morgan Stanley instead of Google, Microsoft, Yahoo at the time um, was a big competitor. So I started jet setting on a higher level all around the country, Canada. And that's all of a sudden I went from being broke and working in fashion retail to I was still broke when I worked at Morgan Stanley, but I had a corporate Amex card and I figured out how to do the expenses. So I was putting every major, you know, $50,000 to Harvard. Oh, don't worry, guys. I got it. It's on my credit card because everyone hated doing the expenses. You'd have to fax in. Yeah. I figured out how to do it. So Everyone at Morgan Stanley thought I was the hero for putting every expense under the sun on my on my corporate card, but I was the one getting millions of points. So you I know, love this. That's great. That well, was the genesis. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, too, when we definitely have some college students who are listening to this. So, what was your major in college? I was a Spanish major with an economics minor, and I had a horrible GPA in college. Um, I am smart, but I just, you know, for me, I had ADD and I didn't realize it at the time. And I would sit and lecture and my mind was going a million places. And so for anyone else out there who, you know, you're smart, but you may not be, you know, smart in the, the classroom context. Like, you know, I, I pushed myself into student government and what I learned being the student body president at Pitt and managing a team in a $2 million budget was way more important than you know, the astronomy lecture that I just could never wrap my head around because I, I didn't care. So, so yeah, I was liberal arts to the core, but always knew I wanted to, uh, you know, push myself and be successful in business. So yeah, you can, you can major in whatever. And that's amazing. And then also going from the apparel industry to, you know, into finance, into sort of tech. I mean, that's what I always share with with lots of people. I have three in college right now. I was just having this conversation with my son. It's like you got to just find something that you're really passionate about, that you really love doing. And I love hearing the fact that you were actually always doing points. I mean, it was something that you just kind of enjoyed along the way. But so at what point were, you know, you got beyond flyer talk and you thought like, there's just this real need out, out there for yeah. what I know. Well, I just, you know, I would go to dinner parties and everyone would say, oh, you, you know points. And I would inevitably be sitting down teaching people what I knew and blowing their minds. And, and what I thought was so cool was like, I, could, I was 26 you know, I didn't have a huge, you know, great GPA, but I would sit down with the neuro, you know, physicist. You know, I actually remember sitting down with the brain surgeon and I taught him very simple things about Amex points and his mind was blown. I was like, this is cool. I have this little skill that like, to me, seems so simple. Um, and then, so it was, it was 2009, I remember. So during the recession, it was miserable working at Morgan Stanley. Even sure. though I was in recruiting, I'm six foot seven, uh, I, you know, I was still in HR. So whenever we do layoffs or the reductions in force, I would always be used. I was the Grim Reaper standing outside of the conference room and I would have to walk people to the elevator, 
And not only that, these lifers at the company, I, the awkward elevator ride down and they're like, okay, I'm good. I'm like, no, actually I have to walk you to the turnstile. And that was like, so oh my god yeah so crushing. and then when up in the air came out it was literally my life i had all these freaking flyer miles and i was like you know working you know in a miserable type job but uh you know kind of on that hamster wheel uh the moment for me came when i got promoted but they were like you know your promotion is not getting laid off you know it's the recession you know you won't start making money here till you're 30 just grind it out for a few more years and i just remember being in my you know late 20s in new york wanting to get ahead. I had no money. I had millions of points. I was going to the Maldives, but I had $200 in my bank account. I just was like, I need to make money. And my ex at the time was like, Brian, you're brilliant. You give away your skill of points. You know, you're passionate about it, helping people plan trips. You should charge. So my, the points guy originally wasn't even a blog. It was just a, a form you could fill out. And I would charge you 50 bucks per ticket if I could help you use your points to go on a trip. So I started off as a kind of travel agent for points. Mm -hmm. And then a friend was like, you should start blogging. This is 2010. And he, you know, off the, you know, he just said, I'll set you up for free. Um, and when you, or he, he was an SEO specialist. I didn't know what SEO was. He said, just write good content once a day on a good cadence and just write good stuff. Don't try to do any of the weird SEO things. And sure enough, the audience started to build, um, and, and, you know, early in 2011, my life changed when I learned about affiliate marketing. When a friend from college who I stayed in touch with said, Brian, I'm going to change your life. Meet me for a drink. And I truly thought he was asking me out on a date and I was not <laughs> interested. But I said, you know, Brian, just go. And he worked for an affiliate marketing company that represented Chase. And he said, you know, Chase reads the points guy every day. You know, I was so naive in my head. I love blogging. I probably had 30,000 monthly uniques. He's like, they love your stuff. And, and all of your readers are the consultants and who they want to get their message in front of. And most importantly, you've got a young audience. So he got me into affiliate marketing where, you know, just by putting the link, to, I was already talking about credit cards, but, you know, that Chase United card, I would use my link. And if someone got approved, I would get paid a, you know, pretty sizable bounty. And literally it changed my life. I think the first month was like $5,000, which I'm like, okay, this is almost like my salary. And so just you were literally, just, just to simplify it for people on the actual blog, you yeah. would, you would just stick a, the link for people to sign up for these credit cards. Right. So when I'm talking about the United card, get you free check bags, instead of just going to like chase.com slash United, I would use my special link that would track a cookie. And if that person actually got approved for the card, I would then get paid through these like middle marketing agencies. Um, and it, and it was just simple. I wasn't doing anything different. I was just using link B instead of link A, and I was making money. And then it was April of 2011. That's the day my life really changed. Seth Kugel of the New York Times had reached out to me. I went through my spam folder randomly one day because I was a weirdo. And I see this message, New York Times inquiry. And Seth was the, the frugal traveler. He was budget travel. He said, Brian, I have shirked points my whole life. I tell my readers just to get the cheapest flight. They're not worth it unless you can prove me wrong. And I said, Seth, meet me. We went to an East Village bar for three hours. He booked a free flight that day to Brazil, which saved him $1,000. And he was like hooked. And then he wrote this uh, a post. At the time, it was only digital. And I was so mad because I wanted to be in print New York Times to show my parents. But digital was the best thing in the world for me because he linked to the points guy, you know, the number one site every traveler needs my site blew up, literally. I think it went down that day. So many followers. And then there was also a big chase promotion at, you know, at the time, 100,000 points for a British Airways card. So all of a sudden, I'm just like, I remember being in my Brooklyn apartment. I called off work that day because of this British Airways promotion. I was like, this is going to be big. And then the New York Times hit. So it definitely was. And I had interviewed with him like six weeks before. I didn't even know if he was going to write a story. But it just so happened on the day of this 100,000 point offer. So it's definitely a little bit of luck. Uh, and then that day, I just remember really understanding what it meant when content went viral. Because all the New York Times, you know, high-end travelers were all of a sudden consuming all this Point Sky content and then sending it to friends. Because what I was doing was translating, don't even go to London with the BA miles. You can actually, at that time, you could go to New York to Miami six times round trip for a single credit card sign up. Or you could go to Easter Island because there were all these funky routing rules. So all of a sudden, everyone on the internet's messaging me, I just got this card, thank you. And I remember being like, wow, what a business I'm in. 
people are thanking me for making me money. You know, each, you know, I just sent this to 30 of my family friends. We all got the card. Thank you. And I'm like, this is a business I want to be in. <laughs> Did a lot of these cards then just start reaching out to you? Did they understand like the power that you had? I mean, this is like an accident. I mean, truly, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur, but this is just a great story of not really even every day you're just going along in the journey and like the puzzle just gets more and more interesting, right? Totally. You know, and originally I was rejected for a certain large credit card uh, company and then you know, I think rejection, any entrepreneur, and especially in your podcast series, you hear rejection and like, let that rejection fuel you. And at the time, it's so hard. But, you know, eventually all the credit card companies came on board. And what I did, I saw ahead of it. So there, it was kind of like a gold rush. There, all of a sudden, every other blogger realized I tried to keep it a secret how much money I was making. But then it, word got out and it was the wild, wild west of credit card blogging. Anyone could become a credit card blogger. And then people started coming for me, you know, because I was the newbie blogger in 2010. Oh, you know, my take was, look, this funky, you know, points and miles. So many bloggers were getting so clinical with it. I was putting in a fun context. I work in New York City. My readers don't have time to go run to a Target and buy 44 gift cards and then send in a mail. You know, there's like weird stuff you can do. I said, here's here's what you need to do. So anyway, so that's like when the haters started coming out, which definitely you know, took a toll on me. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm trying to help people. And, you know, people are trying to come for me. But um, what I invested in was compliance because I worked for a bank. And I knew the notion of if because what I saw happening was get rich quick. You know, people would blog and say, sign up for this card, cancel, 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 then sign up for another because they were creating their own paydays, right? That if you, But I saw two steps ahead of that. And I said, why are you going to bite the hand that feeds you? Clearly, this is going to run, you know, so the point sky has never been a let's screw the bank. It's we can all win together. And it's not even about, you know, screwing the airlines. The airlines have programs of which I play within the rules. I educate consumers to get the most value. They sell billions of dollars worth of miles to credit card companies who charge merchants billions of dollars in fees. Like we can all win here. I, I've never I've taken an approach of like, yes, I'm going to, you know, recommend products and I'm getting paid on, but I'm going to do it in a way that makes sense. And it's not punitive to anyone in that chain. I think that's why the points guy has grown. We've got over a hundred employees now. Um, so yes, it's, it's been a, a wild ride. And as, and then throughout the years now, we now launch credit cards. So I, you know, we'll work with credit card companies because we're like a one-stop shop where we've got influencers built in. We've got Social media, social media, you know, and our SEO presence, anything we write about in the credit card space is essentially, you know, very more often than not page one Google organic, which is simply put, I sometimes like to tell people I was like just blogging on a gold mine and I never even realized it. That's wild. How do you think about your target market? Has that changed significantly since you first started? So our target, I mean, our core demo has always been 25 to 38 you know, 40, like urban dwelling, millennials, consultants, uh, you know, bankers, road warriors. Of course, we've got, you know, part, we've got everyone from stay at home moms in Kansas who read the point sky. There's no, not just one, but you know, I know, and it's funny, like when I'm out in the wild, when I'm in an airport, I can see people, like, I know that person reads the point sky. Like, you know, there's, you know, it's like the, the up, upwardly mobile younger, they're not rich yet because, you know, they're, saddled with student loans, but they're smart about their credit. Um, but of course, as we take the brand to the next level, we've got to be more inclusive um, in our content. And there are so many demos, you know, retirees who have great credit and tons of time to travel. Um, and to, you know, to the other end where we want to do a whole TPG college tour, we need to, I would, I'm passionate about teaching kids about credit. You don't have to wait till you get a job and get rejected for that first apartment and have to have mom and dad co-sign. You can actually be building credit smartly throughout college so that you've got a great score. You know, so so I believe, you know, and, and at the point scanner, we've got, you know, we're expanding our content team. But the biggest thing that'll help us get, because it is just a lot of knowledge, it takes time, but it's using technology now to bring more people into the fold. And that's, you know, my biggest uh Accomplishment, I, I would say now over the next, you know, is, is our Point Sky app, which is now available for download on the Apple App Store, soon to come on Android. You can just type in the Point Sky, and the app's going to help you using technology figure out the right credit card. And then once you amass your points, we actually will give you your, your points net worth, what we value your points at today. And people are always shocked. 
at how much their points are actually worth. And then more importantly, getting people to use them. Um, and because it's overwhelming, you know, you've got Amex and Chase points. Each of them has tons of partner transfer partners. And those partners have partners. I mean, the, the mathematics of it can get overwhelming even for me. So we're bringing in, you know, we've created these algorithms and tools to help consumers simplify it instantly and put goals, you know, in mind and, and actually achieve them. I love it. What do you think has been the hardest thing of not only the biggest surprises, but just in building this company? I mean, you know, obviously the start out of a passion and an interest that you had, and then it sort of grew. Now you said you have a hundred employees and what, what's what been kind of the hardest thing in growing this and most surprising? Well, first in the beginning, I made the mistake of not hiring enough people. I was, you know, I never took an investor. I, I had a $10 domain of which many people said, oh, the points guy, you'll never be able to scale that because it's just going to always be you. And now we actually have more women that work at the company. We've got a UK office. We've got own, you know, our family travel influencers all under the points guy. And we're going to continue to grow that. I didn't have I, like the scale and investing in the right people early enough. I kept it way too lean for years, which, you know, look, I'm proud of the history of our company and what we've done. But I think we by bringing in smarter people um, earlier, I was bringing in people that I knew and kind of that were below me in certain ways. Like a lot of people, I was hiring people that I knew would do what I wanted when in fact I should have been hiring people that were way smarter than me and made me uncomfortable with like the business plan. Because truly, I mean, the, the business was profitable from day one, essentially. I'm super lucky. And then I, I sold in 2012 to a publicly traded company. We then were acquired uh, in 2017, Bankrate, that company was acquired by a company called Red Ventures. So I've been on an interesting journey where most founders leave. I had a three and a half year earn out. So in 2015, I should have left this business, but I was passionate. I mean, it's, I mean, I have the best job in the world. I get to travel around the world and, uh, and help people do the same. But um, I would just say, yeah, the challenges were always scaling it and bringing in people that would, you know, I was always so nervous. Well, the credit card referral fee, you know, so focused on our one lucrative stream, which it's a great revenue stream and highly, you know, high margin, but, you know, 2020 hit and it was a whole different story. So uh, we're now pushing ourselves in ways that I think we should have years ago, direct to consumer, the TPG premium experience, and certainly rolling out our app and giving, you know, personalized experiences is going to be the biggest next step. And I think from that, we're going to be able to grow into a lot of different areas. So you touched on this, the 2020, the pandemic, how did that change your business? I mean, it turned our business upside down, you know, because travel fell off a cliff and with it, you know, credit cards, which were still, you know, our big, you know, uh, clients, you know, they, in, in, you know, April, May, June of, of 2020, the risk departments at credit card companies were like, we don't know what, you know, there were signs. Yeah, I remember the headlines, depression, looming, the great, you know, the mega depression. And it's like, we, you know, no one knew up from down. So, you know, we're in the credit card acquisition business and no one wanted credit cards. We couldn't give them away for free. You know, the credit card companies were like, stop. We don't even want new customers until we can figure out what's what's going on. So luckily I had sold the company and we're, you know, part of Red Ventures, which is a very profitable, highly diversified you know, conglomerate of companies. So we wrote out the storm and we didn't lay off anyone. We actually invested for the future. We doubled down on our app and we're able to, to do that. Um, but I think emerging from this, now travel's back. Of course, it's taking some dips now, but with the launch of our app and figuring out you know, rich consumer experiences, like how do we help people travel in this day when so many flights are canceled? You know, What travel insurance should you get? Like, There's still a lot of big consumer problems that now we're tackled. We want the points guy to be the ultimate like from start to finish, how to get you somewhere. And then we acquired Lonely Planet uh, during the downturn that we're re uh, going to relaunch soon. And it's going to be a revitalized. Now, once you get there, this is how Lonely Planet will help you explore in this new post-pandemic. Well, we're still in the pandemic age of travel. So knowing what you know now, you've been through, you know, some crazy times. I mean, starting your company during the Great Recession, right? And continuing through the pandemic. What advice would you give entrepreneurs who are just starting out? I think, you know, the rejection thing is big. Like, I remember so vividly, like, just wanting to get on the Today Show. And time and time again, they're like, no, you know, like, you're not the expert. And 
and like letting that rejection fuel you. And even like, you know, I was riding high, you know, February, 2020 business is booming, you know, everything's going. And then we just, it was flipped on its head. But in those moments of our business going from gangbuster to the first time in the history of the company, losing a lot of money, I did I, I, you know, but that allowed us, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of smart people at Red Ventures who, you know, we all huddled and we're like, let's take this time. Let's stop focusing on revenue. Let's take this like downturn. And instead of twiddling our thumbs, like let's plan for the future. Even like our, our, uh, our executive leadership planning, it, it was like 2022 was the name of the, the group that we started. Cause we just kind of wrote off even 2021, like let's start longer term thinking. So I guess letting those seemingly despair moments like truly fuel like the future. And it can be hard to see in that time, but like just embrace it and like use every down, you know, seeming failure as an opportunity to rebuild and regrow stronger. I love it. And I think that's how I think about it too. I mean, for us, we started our company Hint in 2005 and 2008, 2009 were some of the most gnarly uh, years for us, but I think more than anything, we we didn't do stupid deals. We made sure that we, you know, looking at the entire company and figuring out what can we do. And it sounds like that was really, you use the time wisely in order to figure out how to weather the next storm uh, should it come along. And I think that that's what entrepreneurs need to do. But more than anything, you just go, and start and start to do something do something that you're that you're passionate about that you're curious about i mean that's what i see in your story this was always i'm sure people say of course you started the points guy i mean you were the points guy you were always the points guy and you know and you you can be good at something you just have to find that thing inside of you that you're really passionate about so i i love hearing your story Thank you so much. It's been an interesting ride, uh, for sure. And actually, interestingly, I think I became more innovative on travel. Before the pandemic, I was on a plane nonstop. You know, I had a team in London, Austin, Charlotte, and then based in New York, feeling like I had to have FaceTime with each of them all the time, plus client, plus we do a lot of charity work globally, plus also trying to have a personal life. And even though I was constantly on a plane, I was drained. So like when the pandemic hit, I stayed on the ground for 100 days, which I know many people were way longer than 100 days that didn't get on a plane. But for me, that was a long time. And, you know, rescued a dog and learned to ride a horse and challenged myself in all these really interesting non-travel ways. But in in learned to kayak, I kayak almost every day when I have a chance and just have these moments of zen that um, I think have helped me to like really refocus. You know, I think when we're exhausted, the the level of innovation, I know we're in a culture that values busy, 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 but I'm hopeful that especially a lot of other people throughout the pandemic have realized you can actually do more by investing in yourself, you know, self-care, not get it. I was addicted to jet lag, I joke, because it was true. Travel can be an addiction and too much of anything's not a good thing. So uh, I'm hopeful to keep this kind of balance as I go forward. As the world's now reopening, I find myself struggling with saying yes to everything again. And I tell myself, well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Do I need to go to every single event that now, oh, you know, so it's a challenge, but I think I'll be a better leader and just healthier person as long as, you know, just remembering to keep that balance. That's so true. What what is the the biggest points deal that's out there today? Obviously, this won't air for uh, a couple of weeks, but I mean, as of today, what would you say is the most overlooked deal that's out there? Well, I think in general, points people are sitting on points or up to their gills. Use them because in general, points lose value at, over time. So if you're going to keep your points and think, oh, in a couple of years I'll use them, you're probably going to lose. Also, what happened over the pandemic is most loyalty programs waived cancellation fees for points tickets, which is amazing. You can book a ticket and at the last minute now, for whatever reason, you can get all your points and miles back and cancel versus when you buy a ticket. Yes, they say no change fees, but you're going to get a crappy voucher that you're probably going to forget to use. So I, in general, use points to book travel, especially if you're not certain you want to go somewhere because it gives it's like buying a refundable ticket, which we all know is super expensive. That being said, Europe, I mean, I've traveled to Europe extensively this summer. I'm going to France in uh, October of this year. And 
I just use my Amex points. Amex now has transfer bonuses to 12 different airlines. And this is, I'll just give one example. So Air France, because there's no business travel, Air France has tons of business class seats for 57,500 miles one way. Uh, so 150,000 round trip business class. Delta, for example, charges 500,000 on many of those routes for like an inferior product. Not only that, with the 25% Amex transfer bonus, means I'm only redeeming 45,000 Amex points one way business class to Europe, and it's fully refundable. A couple hundred dollars in taxes and fees. And there's availability every day. Planes are empty because people are afraid. And I'll say Delta is crazy in the US, but it's not in Europe. I feel way safer in Europe, you know, in places, you know, where there's 80% plus vaccination rates and, you know, you can easily eat outside and explore culture. So I know people are nervous to travel, but I mean, fall in Europe is spectacular. The crowds are fewer. It's more Europeans traveling. So uh, use your points to go to Europe. How about the holidays? Are people, do you see people using up their points and asking questions around, you know, Christmas, New Year's? I mean, what, what seems to be the hot spots? I mean, the hot spots are Hawaii, um, you know, Mexico. People want to stay closer to home, which I understand. The funny thing about staying closer to, you know, staying closer to home, I mean, right now, hospitals in many parts of the U.S., I actually would not travel to Miami now. I mean, I, I would, but like I would, I would go because my friend who lives in Miami in a very high end area had a routine medical procedure that he had to wait. There was no hospital rooms. Right. And so I actually find it safer to go to places that are not overrun uh, with COVID. But but basically, I mean, people are going to the islands, you know, even though the CDC is putting what I would recommend to people, if you're going to go to a small Caribbean island, like look into the COVID numbers in the hospitals. Even if you don't get COVID or you're not worried about it, if you you know have something random happen to you, you don't want to be a burden on their system or not be able to get care. So um, I would just tell people, do your own research. Don't let the media kind of panic you into making decisions. Look at data, where you're going, the vaccination data, and just know that when you're traveling on a plane where people are wearing masks and if you're vaccinated, you know, there's... I hate when the government will say, oh, Turks and Caicos is level four. You shouldn't go there. But what does it actually mean? Look at your own personal risk and where you're actually going. Um, and often, I think we make irrational decisions based on like news headlines or whatever and not based in fact. We we'll push people to think independently about. And I know it's difficult with kids who are unvaccinated. At the end of the day, everyone has to make a decision that they're comfortable with. Anytime you leave your house, there's going to be a risk level. But. God, I hope for the day we can stop talking about COVID and travel. I know. <laughs> it's, it's so true. What about hotels? Like any chains in particular that you think are just crazy, like great, great deals out there worldwide? I think Hyatt's done an amazing job. They're, they've made some acquisitions. Their portfolio is bigger and bigger. Their value prop's really great. If you have chase points, you can transfer to Hyatt one-to-one. -one. For example, what this means is like, you know, the Park Hyatt Paris, it's an iconic on um, plus one dome. It's 30,000 points a night. And even during the pandemic, it's $1,000 plus a night. So you're getting over three cents per point in value. Um, that to me is a great value. So I think, you know, Hyatt has done a really good job. They've got, a, I know at the Point Sky, a lot of my editors, everyone's crazy for Hyatt. They've got lots of good promotions and with elite status, with their co-branded credit card. Um, so I kind of think of Hyatt as like the rising star throughout the pandemic. I love it. Well, this is so much fun. Uh, I'm going on to the points guy and going to try and figure all this uh, out for myself for sure. And thanks everyone for listening. Please give Brian five stars. I'm so excited that you came on and everybody download his app as well, the brand new app. And uh and thank you so much, Brian. Uh this is this has been so much fun and we are here every Monday and Wednesday again. If everybody would please share this podcast with people. And also, if you have not picked up a copy of my book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, I have my own entrepreneurial journey. Uh, it's amazing how much crossover in some ways it is with Brian's and just all of the kind of ebbs and flows along the way that he went through. I definitely chart that out in, in this book too. So hopefully you'll get a chance to read this. And uh, where can people find you too, Brian, on social? On social. So at the Point Sky on all channels. But then if you want to follow me personally, I, I detail all of my travels from start to finish at Brian Kelly. 
I love it. And as you mentioned, just download the Point Sky app in the Apple App Store and please give us five reviews or five star reviews. I need to get better at saying that. That's awesome. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. And thanks again, Brian.